Good morning. It's still, it's still morning. It's still okay to say good morning, uh, but we will be transitioning into the afternoon soon. And, uh, and with that in mind, we need to get going and uh, provide lunch. We're excited that you're here. Welcome to Spring Arbor University. And uh, if you've not been to campus before, uh, we're excited that you're here. Uh, Spring Arbor is, uh, is uh, ranked as one of the top values of higher education in the entire region. And uh, if you don't know about that, you can go on our website and read a little bit more about it. But if you look at the return on investment, and I'm sure many of you are, are intrigued and, and think about you know, what you get for what you spend, the return on investment, Spring Arbor University in the entire state of Michigan ranks second in return on investment, the value of a degree 10 years after graduation. And if you look at private Christian higher education, because we are an intentionally Christ-centered institution and everything we do, everything we say. If you look at private Christian higher education with the number one return on investment, most valuable degree 10 years out east of the Mississippi River. And so you're at a fantastic institution. Thank you. And, and we're, we're honored to have you here today. We're excited uh, that Mary Kramer is back, gonna, gonna um, speak and, and share with us today. But uh, uh, to start us and, and provide an invocation for our time, uh, Jack Crisula, who uh, has a radio show, Anything is Possible, Sundays at 9 on WJR. If you've not listened to it, um, it's a fantastic program. Uh, you know, probably the, the worst person he's ever had on, on the show is me. And uh, it was a, the, the, I told him, I said, it's the most natural conversation and the quickest, uh, uh, was it an hour and a half? An hour, quickest hour, see, it, you know, it, to me it seemed like three, but it was, you know, an hour, no, but the quickest hour that I've ever been a part of. He's a very gifted gentleman, and, uh, and so Jack is going to come and, and uh, give our invocation. Jack. Thank you, Brent. Lord, make us an instrument of your peace. Where there's hatred, let us sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there's doubt, faith. Where there's despair, hope. Where there's darkness, light. Where there's sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, and to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. And that's a prayer from St. Francis of Assisi. And our speaker today has lived that prayer for decades. And uh, the state of Michigan is better because of what Mary Kramer has done. So it's an honor to be here, Mary. God bless. Thank you. Um, I do want to uh, give a couple uh, thanks uh, to different individuals that are here. Uh, Martha Fersenow from American One Credit Union. Thank you very much for sponsoring uh, the students from the Ganey School of Business that are here. If you're here from uh, the Ganey School of Business, a student, would you stand up so we can recognize you? And these are the, the students that have an opportunity to be here tonight, today, because of American One Credit Union. Martha, thank you very much. Uh, we also uh, know that we have a, um, a couple of, at least one elected official and a rep from, uh, from an elected office. And so, if you're an elected official, would you stand? Or if you represent an elected official, would you please stand that we can recognize you? So Bruce and Gary, Peter's office, and Jerry, thank you for being here and your support of Spring Arbor University. Uh, I want to acknowledge and thank Tom Cobb. He's, he could not be here. Uh, he's down in Florida um, waiting to come back up till it's, when it's a little warmer. I told him, I said, you're missing the warmest February that you could imagine right now. Uh, but Tom is a, is a good friend of the university. And I remember a couple years back uh, when he approached me and, and President Chuck Webb at the time and said, you know, we really would like to be able to provide for the Jackson area an opportunity to bring in speakers that would challenge our community, that would help us focus on ways in which we could get better as a, as a, as a broader Jackson area and Jackson community and raise the exposure, particularly to Spring Arbor University. I like that second part for sure. And I also like the idea that we could engage the broader Jackson County community and think about ways in which we could make progress in moving forward. And so uh, I do want to thank Tom Cobb for his generosity in making this um, uh, a possibility. And then also the partnership that we have with the Jackson County Chamber of Commerce and, uh, and Mindy Bradish-Orda will come at the conclusion of, of 
our, our time today and, and give some words, but we have a, a strong partnership with them and, uh, and, and even in providing this lunch of the day. So thank you, Mindy and the Chamber for your partnership. Um, This is the, the first repeat speaker we've had with the Thomas Cobb lecture series. And, uh, and so if that's any indication, you'll, you'll realize that uh, what she brought to us in the last time she was here was, uh, was very compelling information for us to consider and to think and to, con and to, and to process through. Uh, but uh, Mary Kramer is a vice president and publisher of Crane's uh, Detroit Business. She's a graduate of Grand Valley State University uh, just think what you could have done if you would have went here. Uh, but uh, good things come from there as well, right? 16 years of reporting and management uh, experience in the newspaper and industry before joining Cranes. Uh, she was the first woman to be elected the president of the Detroit Athletic Club. That's a fantastic achievement. Thank you for your leadership. And that uh, honorary doctorate degrees from a variety of institutions, including Grand Valley State, uh, Alma College, and Eastern Michigan University. And uh, she's just announced that she'll be stepping down from her role. And, uh, and a statement that you made that I thought was uh, one that I wanted to quote you. She said, I'm going to stay at Cranes and focus on Detroit homecoming and other projects. What a great 28 year ride. And so thank you for your leadership there. Thank you for the way that you in have invested in our state. And uh, would you please welcome Mary Kramer. I didn't realize that I was the first repeat speaker. I guess uh, in an academic institution, that means I got more than a passing grade, so I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, I w when I was talking to Ron and about what, to, uh, what I might um, cover today, we, the economy was really an important part of, of the, of the um, discussion. But I'm not an economist, and with Dr. Lewis in the room, I, well, a real economist, um, I, I thought I'd focus on three things that I thought were kind of like pivot point um, uh, places for Michigan right now that I think are very interesting and really will shape uh, can shape the future of our state. Um, as you heard, I'm a, I'm a lifelong Michigander. Um, I grew up in Grand Rapids. I worked at four newspapers, daily newspapers. Remember what those are? Do you, anybody remember? Okay. Uh, and I, one of them was the Jackson Citizen Patriot. And um, I was an editorial writer the, on the opinion page at the Citizen Patriot. And it was just, it was amazing to be able to tell people that I wrote opinions for a paper with the nickname The Sit Pat. So, um, but actually we did have some pretty strong opinions at the paper. Um, so I worked at four of the papers here in Michigan and then went out, state, um, out of state to Buffalo, New York and Greenwich, Connecticut. And those experiences convinced me that I am a Michigander and I came home and uh, eventually landed at Cranes and never expected to be there for 28 years and counting. Um, so uh, I know the state pretty well, at least I think I know the state pretty well. And so I, I picked three, three things that I wanted to talk about today that I thought um, from my vantage point are, are uh, important um, topics as we look at the future of our great state. One is auto related, another is agricultural related, and the third is natural resource. Now, I want to project a little bit in the future, but before we go to the future, we got to look in the rear view mirror a little bit to the past. 10 years ago, we're at 2017, 10 years ago, Michigan was halfway through what we came to call the lost decade. Uh, the University of Michigan economists pegged the job loss from 2000 to 2008 at 336,000 jobs. Um, that was the largest decline since the Great Depression. Most of the losses were in manufacturing. Um, and because the auto industry was cutting back and those jobs were going away, we suffered, our state suffered a population loss because people were leaving. There was no work for them. Um, and, and, and that was just, that was just by 19, or excuse me, by 2007. 2008, 2009, the rest of the country joined us in the misery because in what we call the, now call the mortgage meltdown, the crisis created by the collapse of the mortgage industry. Um, our state's economy had been tied to the auto industry for decades. 
And when the mortgage mess infiltrated the rest of the economy, we really had a mess on our hands. Um, but it really started long before the mortgage meltdown. Um, as the domestic auto industry lost market share, I don't know what you drive, but I, I always drive, and I, I know that it, 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 it could be an American brand, but it could be made, who God knows where, Mexico perhaps. But I've always believed in driving the American brand cars because I feel at least the profits are coming back home to Southeast Michigan. So, uh, but the, not everybody feels that way. And as the market share for the auto companies went down, um, their problems increased. And to make it worse, they had the high legacy costs, unsustainable production costs, the foreign owned companies that are building in the South, they don't have those legacy costs. Their cost structure is significantly different from the Detroit Three. So a painful decade, lots of job losses, financial collapse, and two of the major automakers went through bankruptcy. Now flash forward to where we are today. We can't fill more than 200,000 open jobs in this state, and many of them are in automotive, according to the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. Um, today's Detroit News front page story, Tech Race Drives Auto Hiring. That is the story of the day, and that is really the, the, the first trend that I wanted to talk about this morning. It's the mashup that we're seeing of Silicon Valley and uh, Detroit. And what do I mean by that? Well, you read about the connected cars, you read about autonomous vehicles that require software and hardware. And the race is, and the, and the betting is, who's going to build and drive that industry? Will it be the traditional automakers and their suppliers, or will it be the Silicon Valley hotshots? That's really the issue right now. And I think how that, uh, how that um, uh, battle uh, uh, turns out really will shape the economy of this state. Um, so uh, automakers are buying tech companies right now at a pretty fast clip. You've probably seen some of the news of those acquisitions. Sometimes they bring people to Detroit. Sometimes they keep the company in Silicon Valley. I had the chance to hear someone, one of our expats, a uh, Detroit expat who's a billionaire, tell me <clears throat> he knows both Detroit and Silicon Va Valley very well. Um, Tony Fidel <clears throat> is his name. You may not know that name. He grew up in Gross Point, Lebanese family, went to University of Michigan, became an engineer, did not go in the auto industry. He wanted something different. He went out to the West Coast. He worked for a company called Apple, and he had this idea, the iPod. And he was the lead engineer on the development of the iPod, made a ton of money at Apple, went off and started his own company called Nest. It w and I thought, Nest? He sold it to Google for $3 billion? Isn't that just a thermostat? No, it is the Internet of Things. Before anybody was talking about the Internet of Things, he created the system that you could run your house with a smartphone. So he sold that company for $3 billion to Google, and he was in Detroit last year speaking at a crane event, and he was talking about the, oh, thank you. He was talking about um, the, um, the, the, this, this Silicon Valley versus Detroit. And he's predicting he thinks that Silicon Valley thinks of the world as one big so uh, software problem to be solved. They have no idea how difficult and how many parts it takes and the coordination it takes to build a reliable and safe vehicle. So he thinks that really that there's not really so much the battle as the opportunity for Metro Detroit, for Southeast Michigan. And his advice to Detroit is Build as much infrastructure as you can to test these vehicles. Get a campus-like environment in an urban area that people would want, that Silicon Valley does not want to go to work in Warren, Michigan. They might go to work somewhere in Detroit because it's urban and authentic, and that's where the talent, a lot of young talent wants to be. I'm not sure about the students at, at the, from the business school, but what, what we see and what I've watched Dan Gilbert build in Detroit his play into Detroit starting in 2010, he always framed it as a talent play. He said that the people he needed to recruit to his company, Quicken Loans, would normally go to Chicago or another big city, and he wanted to keep them in southeast Michigan. But he said that talent did not want to be in an office park in Livonia looking at the Costco roof across the highway. 
They just, that is not what the young talent he was trying to recruit wanted to be. That's not the environment they wanted to be in. They wanted to be in a walkable, authentic urban area. And so that is what Dan Gilbert has invested in creating. So can Detroit replicate that kind of environment? Well, the one thing that Detroit has going for it is if we can remember far enough back, we were the Silicon Valley of the early 1900s. There were hundreds of automotive companies in Detroit. Now, not all of them survived. There were lots and lots of startups trying new things. They got bought by other companies. It all shook out eventually. But if we can recreate that ecosystem again, um, Tony Fidel and others say, Detroit could be the center of the automotive universe as it had been in the past. And it, actually, it's called the mobility universe now, not the automotive universe. And so, we, Detroit is uniquely positioned. We already have the engineering talent. We already have the auto companies. And there's this new play. It's, it's not automotive. It's not necessarily building cars that every family has one or two cars. It's a mobility strategy um, that may take shape in different ways. Some people think that the two or three family car may be going away because you'll be able to summon an autonomous vehicle. You need to haul stuff. You summon the autonomous vehicle to your home and you do whatever you need to do with that vehicle for that time. If you've got a black tie event that night, you summon a Cadillac or a Rolls to your home and you go out with that vehicle for the evening. It's a different way of thinking about mobility. It's not necessarily um, ownership as we have always thought of it. Now, I know some of you have um, talked about or watched the Super Bowl last in, in uh, well, I guess it was a few weeks ago. I'm going to play an ad from the Super Bowl, and I'm going to ask you to, um, if when you realize what company this ad is for, uh, please um, shout it out. That, whoops, I want to get out of that. <laughs> um, I, I, that ad was the first time I saw Ford Motor Company, which has created a new mobility company, a subsidiary, brand itself, not as an auto company, but as a, as a mobility company. That is a significant change. The question is whether we're so, our, our mindset is so auto metal bending related, will, we, will the companies in Southeast Michigan be able to make this transition from automakers to mobility companies? And that's really the big question that I think will shape our future because if the auto industry recedes, the traditional auto industry recedes, the state better be thinking of other things that are going to take its place. So that's the first trend. The second trend, this is the trend that um, I think we can all relate to. It's changing the way, we're changing the way that we eat. Not only the way we eat, but what we eat. And today in Michigan, I can um, say honestly that you can feel patriotic and proud every time you order an Egg McMuffin. And the reason is, not only are they only 300 calories, I check, um, but the eggs for those Egg McMuffins come from a farm in Saranac, Michigan. The, uh, the, the name of the farm is Herbrick's Poultry Ranch. They supply, listen to this figure, 94 million dozen eggs to McDonald's every year. They're the 12th largest egg producer in the country, but McDonald's is their, 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 their largest company, uh, customer. So McDonald's used to, like other big companies, used to keep its sourcing very secret. They would never tell people where they got their ingredients. Now though, because of the changes in the way that we eat, and we want to know where it came from, how it was made, who produced it, how long was it on the truck, you know, all of these, things, what kind of chemicals are in this thing, how was it processed. Um, we're reading food labels a little bit differently. And so the big companies, like McDonald's, if you're on the highways, 94 and 96, you may have seen the McDonald's billboards that proclaim that their eggs come from Michigan. Or you might be in the thumb area and seeing the big, huge billboards in the wheat fields that say this wheat is being grown for Kellogg's. And there are other examples of the big companies doing those kinds of sourcing um, messages because of this trend of people wanting to know a little bit more about the food that they eat. 
Now, I'm going to show another short video segment, and this is the far extreme of this, um, of this uh, um, food farm to table um, trend. How many people have ever seen the show Portlandia? Ah. Okay, one of the students did. Okay, that's good, all right. All right, so, so Portlandia is kind of a, a satirical view of what we used to, it's kind of Portlandia, Portland, Oregon is kind of to me like Ann Arbor, Michigan, which when I worked at the Ann Arbor News, we used to call it, refer to the city as the People's Republic of Ann Arbor because it was a little on the liberal side. But um, so this is a little segment from Portlandia that takes this farm to table, I want to know what I'm eating, a little, a little more extreme. Now, I think that's hilarious, but I know that, um, that actually those kinds of conversations probably occur in more restaurants than we think. But that's been a big, it, you know, agriculture has always been either the second or third largest industry in Michigan. Um, there's a debate between tourism and agriculture. But this farm to table movement has created new markets for small growers. So, uh, and, it, and um, when we did a, a big exploration of this, a major report on food and this movement last year, and we had an event around it in Eastern Market, we were able to get um, the uh, M&A people, the people from, who acquire companies from Campbell Soup, Kellogg, and General Mills to come to our first ever food summit event. And the reason that they all came, they wanted to meet the companies that were doing innovative things in food because that's how a lot of big companies do their R&D now. They acquire, they acquire. So they acquire other companies. Probably the best example of that is the Garden Fresh Salsa company that was based in, it still is based in Ferndale. It was bought by Campbell Soup. And the reason that they bought it was the technology that Jack Aronson had created to have fresh salsa and keep it fresh, not canned, so less, fewer preservatives. Um, that he had a way, a system of keeping it fresh for a lot longer, and Campbell wanted that technology. So uh, it's, it's, it's an opportunity for the state of Michigan, absolutely. Um, so, uh, and the other opportunities in urban areas, I spoke with some investors recently who are looking at Detroit to buy old factory buildings for vertical farming with uh, aquaponics or hydroponics. And that's the ability to grow lettuce or other things in a building, in an old warehouse. We certainly have a few of those in Detroit. I don't know if you've been through lately. Not everything is redone. And so um, these, this is not just in Detroit, but in other cities as well, that this kind of vertical farming is taking off. Um, investors are looking at it. Companies are growing fish and plants in indoor settings, uh, repurposing these vertical buildings in urban areas. Um, so. The, the, uh, the thing that I think Michigan needs most in it right now is a little bit of economic development help, people understanding what's in their own backyard and at the state level and the local level, trying to help match growers with processors and distributors to really build this f food ecosystem um, to the maximum that we can. Because some of these jobs, especially in processing, can replace some of the manufacturing jobs that we lost in automotive through both the downturn, but also automation. Some of those jobs are never coming back. So that's another trend and something that I think is a great big um, opportunity for Michigan. The third and final trend that I wanna talk about today, I gotta get past her, gotta get, okay. Um, this is clean water, okay. Um, clean water could be our greatest asset in, in the state of Michigan. We're surrounded by it. This whole area, the Jackson area, is known as a lake area. People love to live on the lakes. Um, clean water might be the liquid gold of this century. Uh, and if you don't believe me, talk to people in the southwest part of the United States. Um, I know until recently with the deluge in California, uh, they were really hurting for water as well. I think in this state we've taken water for granted and um, at, to our detriment. Uh, Flint. Michigan would be the poster child for taking water quality for granted. What we learned from Flint, besides the mistakes that were made, is actually the thing that I took for granted, clean water out of the tap. There may be things in the water that we're drinking that we are just totally unaware of. We have infrastructure and water systems that are decades, maybe even 100 years old. 
our infrastructure is very old in the state and we have not invested in, um, in, re in revising it and re in, uh, redoing it. Um, so there may be other problems than lead. The same agriculture boom that I talked about earlier means that some crops are grown with fertilizer and what happens with the fertilizer when it rains, it runs off into our streams and in our lakes and eventually finds its way into lakes like Lake Erie, which if you've read about the algae blooms on Lake Erie, it's a big problem. And that affects not only um, drinking water and things like that, but it affects that third biggest industry that we have, which is tourism. Um, in fact, that when Michigan State University did a survey in the tourism industry about the greatest issues facing the tourism industry, the top five threats or concerns in the survey were related to water. Um, from invasive species to declining water quality of the Great Lakes to the inland lakes. Today I was at a meeting this morning to, to review the results of something, they call it the Michigan, the 21st Century Infrastructure Commission, and it was created by Governor Snyder last year. This group looked at all of the infrastructure in the state, not just um, water infrastructure, but roads and bridges, and, um, and they came up with a startling statistic. One million septic systems in the state of Michigan. And if those septic systems fail, that's going to affect the water quality too. So uh, those are the three issues that, that, I, uh, that I wanted to cover today. Mobility and connected car technology, the opportunity for Detroit, the jobs that are going wanting, especially in the high tech fields. So what is the solution to that? Well, higher education, public and private universities in the state. What if, what if they got together collectively and reached out to alumni to let alumni know what was available in their home state of Michigan? What if we actually work together on something like that? I bet we could fill some of those jobs. The changing habits of American consumers when it comes to food, the ability to build out an agricultural ecosystem, I think that's well underway, but I, I'm not sure all the economic development agencies get that farm to table can be a big economic multiplier. I don't think everybody's there yet. And then finally, the clean water and investment in infrastructure. Um, that's a really big issue, and the price tag is pretty steep uh, to, to invest in our infrastructure. Um, the, the governor's task force has some ideas for that. Um, they have recommended that there be regional um, councils that kind of coordinate infrastructure needs and that the state do some bonding to be able to invest in the systems that have the highest priorities. I think some of us who watched that dam in California when they're airlifting boulders to try and keep the dam, the water back, that was kind of a heads up. Flint is kind of a heads up. Um, the, the fact that 25% of Michigan beaches last year had at least one closure because of bad water from septic, either from septic or from sewage being run over into um, the, 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 the storm drains uh, in high times of, of rain. The sinkhole in Macomb County, oh my gosh. I mean, so you're looking at these, the, the signs of the need for investing in infrastructure are all around us. We just don't have the political will to be able to reinvest in these things. What I was told this morning at this briefing by the person who chaired the, the infrastructure commission is you could bond out today a billion dollars to help pay for some of these infrastructure improvements and it would cost the state $50 million a year to pay for the bonds for 30 or 40 years. That seems cheap to me compared to what, you know, the catastrophes that we could have if we didn't invest in our infrastructure. So the infrastructure is aging, we gotta do something about it. We have jobs available, we should get together and try and not only do the workforce training that I know some people in this room are, are, have dedicated their careers to, but also we need population gain in, gain in the state anyway. We've lost population, we need to restore, retain the population we have and build on it. So we need to start recruiting from outside the state and I think there's a big role for higher education in that. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I would welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you. I think you get extra credit if you ask a question. That table over there. <laughs> any questions? 
Oh. Okay. Oh, yes, there's one. Okay. Well, <clears throat> with automotive, there's a lot of people uh, looking at the issue of um, the auto companies think they've got it, you know, that they're, they're on top of it. Um, and they might be. But when I talk to people in Silicon Valley, it, whether it's Tony Fidel or other people that I know in the Valley who have roots in Detroit, they say that really um, the auto companies still seem stodgy to the real bright Silicon Valley talent. So I think that's an image thing. I think the ad that you saw that Ford did, I think they're trying to shape perceptions, reshape perceptions of what this iconic car company um, is today. Um, so I did have a conversation. I think there's going to be something interesting that might be happening this summer that could be, could be part of, of changing the um, mindset or changing the image of, of uh, Detroit as it relates to the new mobility. Um, Dan Gilbert has done a remarkable, and, and the Illich family, I mean two different billionaire families have done remarkable things in Detroit. And when you consider that Gilbert's first building, he bought it in 2010, and what has happened since then downtown, um, the point that the Silicon Valley people say is to me is that People would much rather be in that environment. Talent would be much rather be in that environment that, rather than the tech center that GM has in Warren or the new investments that Ford Motor Company is doing in Dearborn or what FCA is doing in Auburn Hills. Um, so I was on a trip to Israel in early February and Governor Snyder was part of this group that went to Israel to look at technology companies in automotive because um, Israel is, is just an amazing hotbed of startup activity. Um, they're very good at cybersecurity and software. Um, if anybody used Waze the, on, your, on your smartphone, to, okay, that was an Israeli company that was purchased by a US company. So um, anyway, on this trip, I was talking to the governor about you know, the image of Detroit and do you think we could um, attract talent? And he said, Actually, there's an auto company that is very interested in creating a campus in the city of Detroit. And then we had to play 20 questions, and I didn't ever got anything more out of him. <laughs> and uh, he said, this conversation has ended, Mary. And so I said, okay, sir. Uh, but I do think there's going to be something, there may be something this summer. And if it's big enough, it could be like Dan Gilbert coming downtown. It could be the thing that would stick the flag in the ground and help create a talent magnet for um, the brightest computer engineering uh, minds that might otherwise go to Silicon Valley where it's way too expensive to live anyway. So, and yes, question. Oh, that's a very interesting question. It's really interesting. I get um, a million emails a day, and I get all these subscription offers now from the New York Times. The best thing that ever happened to the New York Times from a paid subscription standpoint is Donald Trump because um, their subscriptions have gone through the roof. Uh, people have gotten so accustomed to getting free content. The biggest mistake the media industry did was allow they, – they thought, oh, more people looking at the website. We can sell more advertising. Oh, it'll be great. Uh-uh. And that's why we've had uh, a collapse in the financial model for, for, for many newspapers and news organizations. Um, but as far as supporting the free press, um, I think the, the main thing is to be a very judicious reader. I mean, I see things in mainstream media, including the New York Times, that make me crazy because I feel like what I see is a bias and I, and I feel that people who are on one side or the other will see that bias, the same bias I see, they don't see, the New York Times doesn't see. I see it. And, and uh, not on everything, but enough, enough. And so I think we have to be judicious readers and, and read analytically 
and make sure that the, those news sources that we are consuming are credible. And question, I mean, we, we should be questioning. You know, objective media is a relatively new phenomenon. You, how many people have seen Hamilton, the show Hamilton, right? Okay. I mean, that era, I've started because of Hamilton and because of some other things. I, I've been reading a lot of revolutionary era biographies. Alexander Hamilton bought or started a newspaper in New York to represent his point of view. And, and if you think the things are vicious in the media now, wow, you should go back and look at some of the old newspapers. Uh, objectivity is a 20th century phenomenon. And uh, it, I, it came into being, I think, in the 1920s after World War I, but it is not, not, not historically part of what um, uh, the, the journalism scene in America has been. So, um, but getting back to your, your question, pay for a paper, pay, subscribe to stuff. Subscribe to it in print or online or whatever, but support the media um, through advertising dollars and through subscription fees. And, and when you hear people saying nutty things and they're citing this stuff, say, really, where was the sourcing on that? Where was the question the sourcing? I was thrilled to see Facebook finally, um, Zuckerberg, looking at the algorithms so they can uh, better um, uh, sort through and filter some of the nutty stuff that was coming through last year during the campaign, because it was flat out wrong. And people were spread, I would get these emails at work and I'd say, there isn't a newspaper called the Salt Lake City blah. You know, and, and I, it, it just, it was driving me crazy because people, normally educated people, were taking as gospel these things that were spreading virally through the internet. And, and I said, look up, is there a Salt Lake City Times Tribune, I don't think so. So this thing that looked like a newspaper story, really, it was fake. It was fake news. So I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? Yes. Well, I think, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm not an economist, but what I, what I see is that um, uh, the opportunity is that these big companies that want to process the food, the wheat, the this, the that, will want to be close to the source of the food so you don't lose shelf life. You know, all the produce that's coming in from California, how long do you think it takes? on a truck, a refrigerated truck, to get to the Midwest and then go through a distribution system and all. That's why this, there's great investor interest in this aquaponic, hydroponic. I don't know if that's going to take off, but that's why I think there's investor interest in those things, because if you can, if you can cut down on the dependence on um, the uh, produce coming out of California or the produce, we've had problems in food safety with some food being imported from South America. We've had examples of that. So if you can, if you can control that food chain a little bit better um, for the fresh stuff, and if you can process more closely to the source, uh, I think that's where the opportunity is for economic development. I'm not, I can't, I'm not qualified to talk about exports and imports because I don't know enough about it. Sorry. Any, anybody else? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I always enjoy hearing you speak. So Ron told me I get to close the program, but he didn't tell me how long I had, so <laughs> lucky you. <laughs> I am Mindy Bradish Orta with the Jackson County Chamber Experience Jackson and Anchor Initiative, and I am going to take a minute to bring Mary's message to Jackson, because you had a lot of great points, and I think that they're true for us just as they are for Detroit and our whole state. So on the first point, uh, unfilled jobs, high-tech jobs, educated people working to create an authentic, oh hi Bill, so this is very relevant, uh, young talent coming to authentic places, this is exactly what the Anchor Initiative was formed to do. So with Jacob Hurt and the Anchor Initiative um, contributors and board members, which SIU is one of, we are actively working day to day to create a vibrant downtown where young, educated, skilled people want to live, 
and work and invest and, and bring their families. And so uh, we're working on that and we definitely see that as a uh, potential for us. And we're mirroring it after Midtown Detroit and what they've done there a lot of, um, with Dan Gilbert. Uh, the, the number two point, changing how we eat and what we eat and where it comes from and the debate on what's the number two, what's the number three industry, I say it's agritourism. It's both. Um, I experienced Jackson Hat, our visitors bureau for the county. Agritourism is huge, ag agritourism. And it's also big because it's authentic, which gets back to your first point. Uh, we want information and we want authenticity. We want to know where the stuff comes from, but we also want to be part of that. We may not want to go out there and collect the eggs ourselves or even butcher the chickens ourselves, but we want to tour that facility. We want to see it. And so the concept of the hydroponics in the buildings, I think that is a tourism destination as well. Anything unique like that where people can walk in and see the process and have their hands on it in some way is going to be the future for a lot of our uh, tourism and agriculture. Um, and then the number three infrastructure, of course, the Chamber of Commerce is always working on economic issues. Infrastructure is a big part of that. If you haven't heard, be prepared. Jackson County this summer is going to be full of orange barrels and orange cones. We have more construction happening this summer than we have seen in at least the last decade in, uh, in Jackson, uh, the county, but and specifically the city. It's going to be difficult and it's so important and we need to be prepared for it. We need to be understanding and uh, look for what it will look like in the future because infrastructure is so important. We can't accomplish the one or number two points if we don't take care of that. So um, we're working on it in Jackson through the Experience Jackson Anchor Initiative, the Chamber with our wonderful partners here. There are a couple things that we could use in Illich or, or Gilbert. So if anyone wants to step forward, that would certainly help our efforts along. <clears throat> Uh, and speaking of partnerships, it's always an honor to partner with Spring Arbor University, President Ellis, Ron, Linda, Doug, all of the staff and team that you have built here. We so much appreciate the partnership, whether it's through the Anchor Initiative, the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, through the Anchor Initiative, we're doing some student roundtables, getting the feedback from that talent demographic we want to retain and keep here. Through the Chamber, we uh, partner on programs like this and are hopefully going to announce something soon, a new venture for entrepreneurship with the university. So we appreciate the partnership and always appreciate the opportunity to come out here and be with you. So with that, thank you, Mary. Thank you all for coming. Are you closing us out? This is it. Okay. You are dismissed. Thank you so much.